Uh, right. Hello, everybody, and thanks for coming along. Uh, my name is Simon. Um, I'm a member of the engineering productivity team at uh, Anaplan. We're essentially the team that looks after um, all of the, the build infrastructure and all of the tooling that revolves around that, so the Slack integrations and things like that. Um, we also look after our internal GitHub Enterprise instance and Artifactory as well. I'm kind of like the, uh, the JFrog ambassador at the company. Um, I'm pretty pleased that at least I could get some people along to a post-lunch discussion on Artifactory plugins with this well-targeted uh, clickbait kind of title. Uh, I also considered this one, why this guy wrote an Artifactory plugin, the answer will shock you. And one weird trick for promoting your Docker images, which I thought was quite good. Um, but in the end, I decided upon she promoted her Helm chart, and you won't believe it happened next. So. Um, here we go. So this is a talk about Artifactory plugins. And what we're going to do is we're going to talk about why we wrote a plugin in the first place. And we're going to talk about how we wrote a plugin, OK? Um, so we essentially had a problem to solve at Anaplan, and we wrote an Artifactory plugin to solve it. And along the way, we kind of had a kind of a, a journey of discovery on how to write plugins. And I thought that I would share it with you. So the, when I first pitched this talk to Swampup, it was kind of along the lines of like, um, hey, we got a really cool plugin, and let's show the plugin off. But then I realized, you know what? The plugin's quite simple, and plugins should be quite simple. So instead, um, how about I talk about how to write a plugin? And along the way, I'll show you how we wrote this particular plugin, how it works, and how you might write a plugin as well. So we wrote a plugin for Artifactory, and it's called Atomic Promote. And it was um, designed to solve um, a set of problems that we had around a plan, and it, problems all around um, CI, CD. So we're a, a Jenkins house. We use Jenkins for pretty much everything to do with build tooling in the company. Um, and we didn't see a reason to change that. However, we did have a move towards more CI, CD ways of working. Um, so we had a brand new project that came along last year um, called the New User Experience that we wanted to ship to customers. And we realized we couldn't go through this kind of long-winded release cycles that we currently have. So we decided, you know what? This is the ideal use case for deploying a Kubernetes cluster and getting at least part of our infrastructure onto Kubernetes. Um, so this was a really good use case for it. So what we did was we provisioned a Kubernetes cluster or a set of Kubernetes clusters, and we decided to start, start with Jenkins, right? So we built this shared pipeline library in Jenkins. Uh, the previous talk in this room actually was doing this exactly the same thing. So you know you have a Jenkins file. At the top, you say import shared library. And that shared library allows you to do various things. And so what we wanted to do was uh, we wanted this shared pipeline library to be able to deploy to um, a set of kind of untrusted repositories. Yeah? So you deploy your Helm chart and your Docker images to this kind of unstable state. And then you ask Artifactory, please promote everything up the chain, you know, up to tested and up to production finally. Um, so this was all well and good. And the idea is that when you start promoting things, obviously, each cluster can only talk to each kind of scope or level. So in other words, in the production Kubernetes cluster at the top there, that should not be able to pull Helm charts or Docker images from, say, Helm tested and Docker tested yet. Yeah. And we lock things down with artifactory permissions for that reason. Um, so briefly, this is how the pipeline works. Um, you have a Jenkins file. You deploy to your development cluster. Um, you publish your Helm chart and your Docker images to Artifactory. Um, and those are associated with an Artifactory build. And then you ask Artifactory, please promote my build at the end. And Artifactory duly promotes the build. So at this point, you may be thinking, why did these guys write a plugin? Because Artifactory can totally do promotions. That's a good question. And so we had a couple of things that we wanted to address with the way that Artifactory does promotions. So um, we wanted to promote Helm images and, sorry, Helm charts and Docker images atomically. Yeah. So what I mean by that is if you promote one thing, the other thing goes with it, or nothing happens at all. We either promote both of them or neither of them. So if you remember that previous diagram we had, we had um, Helm repositories and Docker repositories, and they go up together. That's the kind of thing we wanted. So either the whole thing bails, and the user gets an error, couldn't promote, or we get both of them going up together. 
what we also wanted to do was we wanted to um, enforce a variety of eligibility checks on that promotion. B because of the nature of Jenkins shared pipeline libraries, the user ultimately has the ability to call various things that they maybe they shouldn't be able to. And what we wanted to do was to make sure that we could verify that that promotion was correct, that it um, met our um, compliance and auditing regulations. So we do have a variety of things around that that will kick in when you initially commit to your repositories and it'll tell you this is not going to pass compliance. However, we also wanted to enforce that in the pipeline as well. Um, so we had a phone call, um, or a Zoom call, with um, the lovely people of JFrog France, and we said, is this a crap idea, what we're trying to do? And they said, no, it's actually quite, um, quite a decent idea, and we encourage you to develop a plugin and feed it back to the com community. Um, you will c come up with a couple of problems. First of all, um, there's no way to do Docker promotions using the public API, and I'll, I'll show you how to, um, how to do that later. Um, and they also said, you know, that fundamentally the, the way that you do um, build promotions on Docker promotions in Artifactory, they're two different endpoints, yeah, they're two different ways of promoting things. And also, when you promote things in Artifactory, you promote a build, and if you are promoting in the sense of you are moving or copying something up the chain, then usually what you were doing is you were saying, I've got a source repository and a target repository. So let's say I've got a Maven build, and I am moving my Maven outputs, so say a set of jars, et cetera, and some build infos. I'm moving them up the chain from one repository to the other. It's not really geared around this idea of picking things together and moving them in a set. So with that in mind, um, I'm going to take you through how Artifactory plugins even work. Can I get a show of hands? Um, who has written an Artifactory plugin before? Good, a number of people. Who wants to write one but doesn't know where to start? Okay, good, I've got a good selection of people here. So this is gonna take you through how we wrote the plugin, and I'm gonna take you through exactly how to start writing the plugin as well. Um, show of hands again, who really likes Groovy? Okay. <laughs> Artifactory plugins are written in Groovy. Uh, somewhat, unfortunately. I should be careful I say that because I know the creative groovy works for JFrog now. Um, I personally have issues with it. I mean, G-string, come on, G-string. The number of times I've been called up saying G-string out loud in my, in my workplace, it's just crazy. I've been surprised I've been sent to HR. Um, so the way Artifactory plugins work is this. You have a groovy file that expresses your plugin logic, okay? And you'll deploy this into Artifactory. Um, so you'll have my cool new plugin, .groovy. It'll sit in Artifactory. You'll deploy to etc plugins directory. If you're in a HA configuration, that'll be synchronized straight over to the other node. Um, you'll also need to call an endpoint called reload plugins, and that tells Artifactory, can you take a look at the plugins and just make sure that you've loaded them into the, into the Artifactory, um, the JVM context. Um, you can tell Artifactory to automatically look for plugins on a polling basis, but JFrog explicitly say, do not do this in production. It's okay for development purposes, but if you do in production, you can end up in a weird case where you may reload a plugin halfway through and there's kind of undefined behavior that results from that. So you'll be using the public API when you write a plugin for Artifactory. And the public API, um, despite the name, is kind of like a private API. I don't know why, they, I don't know why it's called that. Um, it sits at the heart of Artifactory and allows you to interact with the internals. And when you write a plugin, um, you'll be opening up a, a DSL block, which I'll, I'll show you an example of. And inside that DSL, you will be opening a closure and you'll be writing some Groovy that expresses how to interact with Artifactory. And some of the things you will do is you will say, um, you know, builds.getbuild, um, repositories.getrepository. Um, it also you also have the ability to look at um, um, the security information. You can log out and things like that as well. So they are com for convenience, really, so that you don't have to, you know, call the the public REST endpoint or anything like that, which would be really long-winded and difficult. Um, Artifactory plugins, you, there are kind of 10 different types of plugin. If you look on JFrog's documentation, you'll see there are 10 different types, each of which gives you a different DSL to work with. And there are kind of three main ways that you can initiate or trigger a plugin. Um, some of them are based on uh, cron, so some of them are scheduled. Some of them are event-based, so in other words, um, for example, um, a build-in for JSON is about to be saved or has been saved, or a user has initiated a download and you want to overwrite some behavior, um, you want to modify some behavior. Anytime you want to kind of extend the way the Artifactory works, then you know you're going to need a plugin. 
And the way that promotion plugins work is that you have a dedicated REST endpoint from outside, okay? And I'll show you how that works too. So they are user initiated from outside via the REST API. If you want to start writing a plugin, this is where you start. You go to JFrog's GitHub, um, type in user plugins, and you'll filter by the repositories that you really care about. Um, so there's two that you'll care about. There's the dev environment, which is really good because it provides you a nice Gradle project. And that Gradle project allows you to spin up a real artifactory that you will write your tests against. And it provides you a lot of kind of convenient functions around that. There's also Artifactory User Plugins, which is the single most important resource that you can utilize when you're trying to write an Artifactory plugin, because that gives you a curated list uh, or set of Artifactory plugins that have been designed by um, JFrog themselves and also contributed by the community. And uh, JFrog are very welcoming for people to con contribute plugins to. Um, the documentation for the Artifactory public API is a bit sparse in places, so I found that this is the best resource by far. So if you go to write a plugin, what you'll do is you'll git clone the development environment and you'll create your new plugin folder there. And your new plugin folder, it'll contain two files. It'll contain the plugin itself. Um, so mycoolnewplugin.groovy will be sitting there. And then you'll have this test file as well. And this test expresses a set of integration tests against your plugin, against the artifactory running your plugin yet. So you will stress test your plugin in some way. And I'll show you how those work as well. The dev development environment is a, actually a Gradle project, and the Gradle project has a set of Gradle tasks in it that are specific to developing Artifactory plugins. So when you initially download it, you'll say prepare Art Pro, and that, what that will do is it'll go off to JFrog's website and it'll curl in um, the, whatever version of Artifactory that you want. So obviously you would try to match production or the version that you are about to upgrade to in production. So you might try to match your DR environment or something like that. And then you'd say start at Pro. And what that would do is it's a Gradle task. It'll start Artifactory in the background, you know, a real Artifactory, and um, it'll wait for it to finish and then hand you back control. So it'll run it in the background for you. And the way that it can tell um, that Artifactory started up is it'll monitor the logs for specific messages. It's quite clever. Um, what I should say is it needs a license, yes. You need a real enterprise license. JFrog have no problem with you using a real license for this, for um, you know integration tests and things like that. So you'll, um, there's instructions on the readme on how to license it properly as well. What you then say is work on plugin. So you'd say Gradle work on plugin, and you would give it the name of your plugin. And then the Gradle task will go off and it will try and find your plugin. By default, it will look one directory up. And so in this case, you say, Gradle work on plugin, my cool new plugin, and we'll find this directory, and it'll symlink your, um, your plugin, and it'll symlink the test file straight into Artifactory's um, plugins directory. And then you're ready to go. You can run Gradle test. And then Gradle test will run all of the tests um, that you have in your my cool new plugin test.gruvy file against real Artifactory. So that's really nice, and it's a real artifactory. So when you spin this development environment up, um, you'll see, you know, the really, I love this loading animation that JFrog put in, it's fantastic. And you'll see, you know, it's a real artifactory that you can play around with via the UI. It's available, the, the port is there. Um, the one thing you'll want to do when you start is enable logging. So um, in a production use case, you would have um, a log level of info or something like that. Um, for development purposes, you'd probably want something a bit more, you know, you'd want to go with debug or trace or something like that. But um, yeah, you just need to add a, a new logger entry into the logback.xml file to get logging. That took us a long time to figure out. So how promote, how Atomic Promote was written. Um, I mentioned earlier that uh, JFrog provide a set of um, DSLs with which you can write Artifactory plugins. Um, here's what the one for promotion plugins looks like. So you have this opening promotions block um, that tells Artifactory I'm about to define a promotion plugin. And you name that promotion plugin. So in our case, we've called it Atomic Promote. And then we give it four parameters in our case. Um, there's no real documentation for these parameters except for in the examples in the GitHub. So if you're looking for the documentation, looking in the examples for the one of the example promotion plugins, you'll find it there. Um, the first parameter tells Artifactory, here are the groups. So from the point of view of the permission system, here are the groups that are allowed to execute this plugin, anything else, and you'll get permission denied. 
Um, we can also version the plugins, which is really nice because if we're trying to diagnose issues with Artifactory and you have multiple Artifactories, it's really nice to know which version of this plugin you are running so that you can diagnose issues when you're looking at logs and things like that. Um, it also means that, for example, if you're building this in a pipeline, you can, um, you can bump that version every time you build it. Um, we also then have params. So this is mandatory parameters that we are enforcing that the user passes in. In our case, we are saying um, they have to pass in um, a target score parameter, which we default to tested. Um, you remember the levels that we have in our promotion. We have the sort of unstable, we have tested, and then we have production. Um, so it defaults to assuming that you're promoting from the first to the second layer. And then we open up this closure. Um, so the closure is the last parameter, and the closure is essentially the thing that gets executed when the user calls this promotion. Yeah. So as is standard when you execute a build promotion in Artifactory, you have the build name and the build number. So that's what you give to Artifactory, um, and a set of parameters as well. So this is how we actually call it via the REST endpoint. Um, so as an authenticated user, the way that you normally call the build promotion in Artifactory is you would call pretty much what you have here, so your slash Artifactory API plugins build promote, except onto the end of it, you'll put the name of this promote plugin. Yeah? So you'll put atomic promote, which matches the, um, the function that we have inside the promotions block there. Next, you give it the build name and the build number with which you want to promote, and these link to the build name and the build number that you see there in the closure parameters. Then we open up a query string. Now, the way that the query string works in Artifactory is kind of awkward because we have a query string which is parameters, but then we also mana we want to um, link some parameters into the parameters attribute that we see in the closure. And the way we do that is we delineate with the kind of the Unix pipe parameter that you see there. So in this case, I've said um, CI user is equal to Jenkins and target scope is equal to production. So that's how I'm passing my parameters in. Um, so this is just a refresher on what we're trying to do. So what, what this plugin attempts to do is you, you give it a, um, a build and you say, go and look for the Helm charts in there. Go and find the Docker images that were pushed along with those Helm charts. And I want you to get them both promoted at the same time, okay? If you can't do that, then I want you to just collapse in on yourself and just do nothing and just return an error. Um, so with that in mind, um, I'm going to show you some of the code for um, this promote plugin um, so that you can get a feel for um, what the code looks like for plugins because some people may not have seen um, this code before and also you might be interested to see um, how I've written it. So let's go to VS Code. Uh, let's go full screen. Uh, can everybody see that okay? It's fairly clear. I made sure that my line widths were like quite tight just for this talk. Um, it's good practice, actually. Your line widths should be, you know, 80 characters if you're possible. And um, so th this is the um, the entry point, as you can see. The, so we've already gone through it. This is this where we open the, the DSL. Um, we're logging out some information. We're assuming that everything is OK. HTTP status is 200. And the functionality for this plugin is kind of broken into three parts. The first is some sanity checks. So we're grabbing the parameters that the user's passed in, and we're running some sanity checks on them to make sure that, you know, is what the user is trying to do OK from our point of view? Um, then what we're doing is, after that, um, we're going to ask Artifactory, give me the, the build metadata, give me the objects from the public API representing you know, the builds, and give me the Docker images. I'm going to go off and ask Artifactory, give me all the Docker images. And then finally, step three, we're going to take all of that information, and then we're going to say, promote the Helm charts and the Docker images side by side, please, and then exit. So nice and straightforward. So. Um, Get string property is just a method that we wrote to um, go into this params hash map that was passed in um, that you get in the closure and just um, try to get a target scope out of it. And we're saying true for mandatory. This get string property is in loads of the example plugins that you see on GitHub. It's kind of like a standard method that they tend to drop in there. Then what we do is we calculate the source scope from the target scope. So the scope, remember, is we're saying, um, for, for example, promote to tested. And so the source scope will be the level below. And um, what we then do is we figure out what the names of the repositories are. So we've got the source and the target scope for the Helm and the Docker images. And we just compute what these are. 
and we do some sanity checks on those to make sure that they, you know, they actually exist and it's a valid scope. Uh, you'll notice our Helm charts have dash local on the end of it, and that's because um, we use the backing Helm repository. Um, for those of you who've created Helm, Helm repositories in Artifact, you'll know that you need a local repository and a virtual one in order for, to, for Artifact to act as a Helm repository. Um, so the virtual repository is the one that people actually access and then it's backed by a local repository. Um, so then what we do is we attempt to populate this source build and detailed source build. And uh, this is an example of how to get build information using the public API. So this is where we really start using this public API. Um, so get build is a method that we've got that's uninteresting. Basically, it just says builds.getbuild behind the scenes and does a bunch of san sanity checks. And then we convert that into a detailed build. And the way you can think about these is um, a build object, uh, well, it's actually called a build run object, and it's in the public um, API. The build run object is essentially what you get if, if you browse to a build in the Artifactory UI. The build run is kind of like the, um, the panel that you see at the top. And then the detailed build run is all of the tabs that you see below that. So things like, you know, the list of modules, the release history of that build, and so on. And if anything goes wrong at all, we bail. Um, the next thing we can do is, I remember I said earlier that um, we wanted to put eligibility checks into this plugin. So we wanted to say, you know, hey, if, um, if the user is not eligible to promote this build, or if something is wrong with the artifacts in the build, like it doesn't pass the, our compliance tests, then um, we want to bail immediately. Um, so this should we promote method, um, we're going to be open sourcing this plugin. And at the moment, that just, that's just a method that says return true at the moment. So essentially, that's to be filled in. In our example at Anaplan, um, we've got something, uh, we actually got a REST call in there. I don't think it's really advisable to call out in a plugin, but that's what we do. We call out to a service that just validates the commits and things like that to make sure they pass our standards. Um, and then hopefully, you get a true back from that. So that's that. And yeah. If the user is an admin, it's not, not nice and straightforward, right? We've got the user above by asking the security system. We're saying if the user is an admin, then they can override that because you've always got to have a, an override mechanism in place in case things go wrong, because things do go wrong. Um, the next function is quite interesting. So this is called get Docker digests for artifacts. So there are a number of ways that you can associate um, Docker images with Helm charts, right? You, um, you can put the SHA into the Helm chart. You can tell Helm, you know, here's the exact repository I'm going to and so on. So it is possible that what we could do is we could download the um, Helm chart and we could go in there and we could figure out what we should be looking for. Um, but we thought, you know, that was probably not a good strategy um, for the long run. What we decided to do instead um, was we decided to tag the Helm charts in Artifactory with attributes. And I'll show you what that looks like in the UI. Um, some of you may not know that um, when you can tag things in Artifactory with attributes, and you can actually have lists as well as single properties. So in our case, what we do is we tag the Helm chart with a list of Docker digests. Yeah, so we get the Docker digest strings, and we tag them into the into the Helm chart attributes. So all this method does, I'll show you what it does. Let's have a look. All it does is it says builds, which is again that public uh, publicly available. Um, uh, object that I mentioned earlier, you know, you get all these builds and repositories and so on. So we say builds dot get artifact files and you give it the build and then that'll give you back all the files within that build. And we then go through them and we look for a property called atomic doc docker dot digests. And then we flatten it and then we um, because if you tell Artifactory to store a list on a property, it'll come back as a string that is um, comma separated. So we just split that, flatten it and then return all the ones where it's not null. So that's nice and straightforward. And then what we do is we convert that set of digests into a set of repo path objects. And a repo path is, as it suggests, it's just a, an object representing an exact path to something in Artifactory. Um, so that's what that does. And then we just do a sanity check to say, hey, is the list of digests that we wanted to get the, s the same size as the list of um, Docker actual Docker images that we got back in return. If we didn't get them all, then there's some problem. And in that case, we would cancel the promotion with a 404. We'd say we didn't find some of the Docker images. Um, right, the next part. 
So the next thing that we want to do, we've got all, all of our information ready. The next thing we want to do is we want to say to Artifactory, please try a dry run of the Helm Sharp promotion and then a dry run of the Docker promotion. And if everything goes well, then we know we are probably OK to go with the real promotions. Um, so you can see this happening um, down here. So we do a dry run of Docker, dry run of Helm, and then we do the real ones. And what these do is these call these um, closures that we have here. So here's the Helm one. So all the Helm one does is it creates this promotion object that's available in the public API. Um, so I've got this promotion in get promotion instance method that I've written that um, fills in the promotion object for me because it's just a lot of parameters that go into a promotion. If, uh, I don't know if anybody's called the promotion endpoints. A lot of things you can customize. Um, and it passes this dry run parameter that is also passed into the closure, which means that you know we can run a dry run first. And then we promote the build by giving it this promotion object. And we also say, if you are not doing a dry run, then also add a release status. And a release status, I'll show you what that looks like in the UI after this, but the release status um, sort of comes for free when you do a normal build promotion in Artifactory, but if you do custom promotions, you, ha you are the one that's responsible for adding a release status. And it's obviously really important from our auditability point of view that you have, you know, you want to be able to say, you want to be able to click on a build and see, okay, this was promoted to the tested scope at some point by this user. In our case, it would be Jenkins that would appear as the person who promoted it. Good old Jenkins. Right, so now the Docker promotions. Now, this is a bit more difficult because as I alluded to earlier, um, you don't get um, sort of first class Docker promotion support available via the public API. You have to call the REST API, so the one that everybody else uses. And that's what we do here. So we say Docker images dot each, um, promote Docker image for each one. Yeah, and if any of them fail, we immediately sort of bail out. And remember that we can do a dry run of this first as well. Now, unfortunately, when you try to ask, when you ask Artifactory to perform a Docker promotion, um, you can't do a dry run like you can do with normal build promotions. It's basically you do it or you don't do it. Um, so in our case, what we do is we do a bunch of sanity checks. We say, if, if dry run, then do some sanity checks like does the repository exist and so on. We could be doing a lot better here and we have improved this since, but that's how it is right now. And then what we do is we get the username and password of the current user executing the plugin. And we literally just call the REST API internally, right? So we're running in Artifactory and we call Artifactory's public REST API from inside itself. So 8081 is the Tomcat port. We just call Artifactory's REST API. Um, I didn't expect this to all work when I wrote it, but it just did work, which is amazing. Um, and then we look for this HTTP response code of 200 to make sure everything was successful at the end. So yeah, this is not as robust as I would like. I would like JFrog to introduce a dry run of uh, Docker promotions if possible. I don't know if it is possible. It'd be really nice. Because right now this is kind of, it's not as robust as I would like it. So at the very end then, all we do is we just say, okay, if we got to this point, everything's okay. We log out that the plugin is ended because that's where, you know, you're looking for those blocks when you've written a plugin, you're looking for, you know, if anything goes wrong, you want to know when did the plugin start, when did it end, did it end successfully, and then we make sure the status is 200, and we write out OK. And if you say OK, um, when you call this endpoint, that will come back to you in the response body as well. Yeah, so it's nice. You can see that in Jenkins. You can see OK. We should probably be more descriptive than OK. Um, tests. So tests in Artifactory plugin development are really, really interesting. Um, if only because of how kind of unexpectedly elegant you can make them. So we'll have a look. So this is my directory structure. It's a bunch of sort of irrelevant stuff. Um, but you'll notice, as I mentioned earlier, you've got this atomic promote.groovy, but we've also got atomic promote test.groovy as well. And this is where our tests live. Close that. Um, and so these integration tests look like, well, they look kind of like integration tests, as you'd expect. The, we have um, per test setup and a per test teardown. So the per test setup is telling Artifactory, create a bunch of um, repositories that I want to be there. So it'll create the Helm repositories, the Docker repositories. It'll create this promote group that is eligible to perform the promotions so that we can, you know, we can have a test whereby we remove that group and then we try running it and we should get a 403 in response. Um, 
the tests themselves, you can see, are quite simple, and I tried to make them as kind of plain English as possible by abstracting as much of it as, as I possibly could. So this test is the most basic test you can run against this plugin. It's verifying the very essence of the plugin. We're saying, when I deploy three Alpine images and a Helm chart to Unstable, and I execute a promotion to Tested, so one level above, then I expect that the Helm charts exist in tested, so the level above, and I also expect that the Docker images exist in tested, one level above. So this is quite nice, right? Because if you, th this is the standard way you should be writing tests, right? Is you abstract as much of it away as you can at the beginning. So when the next person comes along and writes a test, they realize, oh, this is very, you know, don't repeat yourself. I've got nice t abstractions with which I can just verify this quick hunch that I've got. I've got some new functionality and I can, you know, you can properly red green artifactory tests then. Um, We've got another test to um, promotion to production fails if service is not present and tested. So we can say um, deploy some Alpine images to um, tested, but we're not deploying the Docker images there. And what we're going to do is we're going to execute the promotion, and what we should get in response is a 404 because it can't find the Docker images. And then we're verifying crucially that neither thing happened. So neither the Helm charts, which did exist, nor the Docker images, which didn't even exist, have been promoted. So again, that's the kind of the essence of the plugin. We're verifying that if something goes wrong, then nothing happens. So that's how um, artifactory tests work. And if anybody um, wants to come and see me after, um, we can go through the code together. I'd be very pleased to do that. Um, I'm really only good with the promotion type plugins. There's a, there's a wealth of plugins available on um, the inside the user plugins. Um, repository on, J on JFrog's GitHub, but I really encourage you to have a look in there because there's a huge number of things that you can extend in Artifactory. Um, it's really, really powerful. And there's some good examples of tests as well that you can look at. I think this is the most comprehensive uh, test suite that I've seen, certainly. We've, we've really um, gone to town with these tests. So I'm going to jump back to the presentation. Okay. Yeah, so this is, um, as I was mentioning, this is what the um, Docker Digest property looks like. So you'll see um, atomic.docker.digest there as the first property in the list, and you'll see the values. It says C list. So you can click that in the Artifactory UI, and it'll open up a modal box, and it will show you the, the list in there. Um, I do warn you, if you are setting these automatically via the REST endpoint, it's kind of awkward. The, the character encodings kind of will, will trick you, and the delineation character that you use will trick you now and again. Um, if you want to see examples of how I've done it, come and see me if you've been struggling with this as well. But you can store lists in properties, which is really, really nice. And this is what the release history looks like. So when we perform a promotion, normally, um, a build promotion, we expect to see this. And we expect to see this if we write our own promotion mechanism as well, right? It's important for auditing purposes. We want to see who performed the promotion, we want to see who and when it happened, and we want to see why as well. So you can add comments as well. Our, ours is just commenting, you know, promoted to target scope. So, um, when, when we started writing this plugin, it was initially just me writing it. So I had this idea that I wanted to write a plugin, and I went ahead and I sort of had fun, lots of fun writing it. And then um, it came time to creating a pull request and giving it to another member of the team to review. And so I created a PR, and I said, uh, Sam, can you please review this for me? And he said, sure. And he checked out the branch from GitHub Enterprise, and he said, oh, I see you've made a readme on how to run the test. I said, that's right, I've been very thorough. And uh, I think about six hours later, he said, I still can't get the test to run. And it turned out he'd missed one tiny step in this readme here, because what you've got to do is you've got to, you've got to get everything in exactly the right order directory-wise, then you've got to crawl all the Gradle commands in the correct order, and you've got to make a minor configuration change to Tomcat to match what's in production so that the tests are pointing in the right place, you don't have to change those, and so on. And then you've got to make some change to the Docker so remember that um, in our tests, we are really using Docker. So those tests are literally using Docker. They are Docker pushing into the development artifactory, which is really cool. However, Docker will not push to a local host repository. 
So if you say push to a localhost repository, Docker will say, nope, not doing it. So what you can do is you can say, okay, I'll add something to my ETC hosts and I'll say artifactory is at 127.0.0.1. Um, then Docker will say, that's an insecure registry, I'm not pushing to that, are you crazy? Uh, so then you say, okay, I'll add HTTP artifactory to my list of insecure registries. Then Docker is happy, it'll push to that repository. So I realized, ah, I missed that out of the readme as well. I've totally forgot that I even did that because I did it over a period of weeks. And I realized, ah, this is not good because if the tests are this hard to run, then not only is it gonna cost us a lot of development time, but also people may end up just not running them. So I might give somebody a, a pull request and they might say, oh yeah, I totally run the test, it's brilliant, why not just deploy it? Um, because they happen to think the groovy code was okay. Because in the real world, right, ideally, integration tests, they should be one click. Although integration testing is hard, it should still be one click. If you can possibly automate it, you should automate everything. So I realized this wasn't good enough, so I set out to automate these tests. And I realized we had three concerns. With the plugin itself, we have Artifactory, sits in the middle, and then we have Docker, which we also want to control in some way. So what we can do is we can Docker compose this, right? So we can say Docker compose up, and we can have a container that runs Artifactory inside it. So we'll say prepare Artifactory Pro, download it, start it. And then we can have our plugin periodically pull Artifactory's uh, ping endpoint, which will eventually return you a 200 with OK in it. So we can get the plugin to keep asking Artifactory, are you alive, are you alive, are you alive? And then we can get the plugin to execute these Gradle commands to say, work on the plugin test. And there's a bunch of other stuff that we'll do as well to configure these tests exactly how, as we want them. All the things that somebody would manually forget to do or would mess up in some way with typos and things. Because, you know, people, people are difficult, people don't read sometimes, and people are tired, and it's best to automate things. And this artifactory is pushing and, you know, it's pulling from a public uh, Docker Hub, or actually it's pulling from an artifactory which mirrors out and it's pushing back into artifactory it's using this docker that we control so this is the re official docker in docker image yeah and inside there all we've done in the docker file is we've said you know from docker in docker and then we've customized it to say that http artifactory is an insecure registry and that's fine and then docker is totally happy and it means that we can have a one-click test setup for this plugin and if we say exit code from plugin what that will mean is we have a um, an environment where we can just run docker compose up exit code from plugin and docker will um, docker compose rather will run the full test suite and when the plugin exits in other words when all my tests have uh, passed or maybe some of them failed um, the whole environment will be brought down and control will, will be returned to the user which is really nice and then we can docker cp the test results out of the artifactory container and if you are a human being, then you would CP the HTML version out. If you are a robot or you are a Jenkins, then you would um, get the XML version out. Um, so in the spirit of designing for the person at the back of the room, here is a tiny text terminal that I'm going to show you that is running our integration test. We're saying run tests.sh, which is kind of like a, just a bash script that runs Docker Compose and then copies the tests out. Um, so you can see here at the bottom, Artifactory is still unavailable, sleeping. So Artifactory is trying to um, start up. And the plugin is keeping asking Artifactory, are you awake, are you awake? Finally, Artifactory starts up. And our plugin says, Artifactory is up, hooray, executing commands. So now what the plugin does is the plugin container will um, set up Gradle and it will run all the tests. So this is massively sped up, by the way, um, because I didn't think we all wanted to sit here watching this. Um, so it's executing all of the tests against Artifactory. The full thing takes about three minutes or so. So it's not actually not too bad from start to finish. And then um, the plugin container is exited with code zero. That's good. And then um, the bash script opens up our test HTML and we can browse to see which tests passed and which ones failed. In this case, everything was good. Fantastic. So I realized once we had this is that um, 
what I could do as well was I could make Jenkins run these tests. Uh, one of the standards we have in our team is that if you have tests, they should be running on PR hooks. Yeah? So when you commit, um, when, you, when you raise a pull request, a webhook goes off to Jenkins and says to Jenkins, run all of the tests, so run Gradle tests. And in our case, we say um, we have a Jenkins file that will run all of these integrations tests. So what we can have is we can have a Jenkins file and that Jenkins file just creates a pod, and inside that pod, um, there's a Docker pod and a build pod. The build pod says Docker Compose up, execute from plugin. And then the last thing that it does is it um, Docker CPs the JUnit compatible XML out of the Artifactory container and gives it to the JUnit plugin in Jenkins, which means that you can see the latest test result in Jenkins um, for auditability, and also means that um, when you raise a PR hook and you look in Jenkins, you'll see the sp spinning circle. Eventually, you'll say, you know, you'll see that Jenkins was okay with your build, all the tests pass. Um, so essentially, what this is is. Um, because we have a Kubernetes power Jenkins, the levels of abstraction here are a bit crazy because what we have is we have a Kubernetes power Jenkins which gives you an agent which is inside a Docker container and then you have a pod that s defines two Docker containers, one of which is a Docker con in Docker container, the other of which is a Docker container that spins up Docker Compose with needs Docker in it. And then of the three of those containers that spin up with Docker Compose, one of them is a Docker in Docker container. So all in all, I think it goes five levels of Docker deep. So it's, <laughs> I think we know we've reached peak Docker and something is maybe a bit wrong when we go this far, but it works quite well for us actually. So all in all, um, you can write Artifactory plugins and have fun and write them as a team and all collaborate together if you have good automation. There are limitations, um, particularly for our use case, because we need Docker, it makes things really difficult because it means, for example, I can't easily PR this into JFrog's official um, um, set of um, plugins because it would make their Jenkins file fail because it, that would expect do um, Docker to be under our control, etc. cetera. Um, so that's not ideal. I'd like to improve that if I possibly could. Um, you can have fun. So if you have good automation, you can, you know, we TDD'd part of this plugin, which, you know, it's amazing for something as esoteric as an Artifactory plugin, you can actually TDD it. So we'd have one person sitting down, write a failing test expressing the, pl the plugin functionality you want, hand the laptop to the person, they would implement the functionality, and then you'd run the test suite, and you'd hope that it passed again, and then we'd switch roles. Um, so you can do the same kind of development that you do with anything else. Um, which is really, really nice. And importantly, because you have integration tests, you can have confidence as well that when you deploy this plugin into production, and you notice I haven't covered deployment um, because that's um, a kind of a separate issue. But when you do put this into production, you can have confidence that it will work as you say it will. Obviously, for complete confidence, you would want to put this into your, you know, your staging environment. Particularly if you're upgrading Artifactory, you'd want to know, does this plugin behave itself in the next version of Artifactory? So you'd still want to perform all those measures, but at least you know the plugin is behaving as you would want it to logically. Um, if you do write a plugin, uh, I do encourage you to open source it because that's the way that we all learn from each other. You know, we had that panel on community this morning. It's really, really important that we all learn from each other and sort of improve the documentation around the place and give lots and lots of examples for how to do cool things with plugins. And look out for Atomic Promote as well. I'm going through a process um, with Anaplan right now where I'm trying to get this um, open source, which so should be available pretty soon. Where am I going to put it? I don't know yet, um, but look out for it. Um, if you go to github.com slash Anaplan Inc., um, it should be there at some point soon. And uh, I believe there's probably not any time for questions. However, I think I'm going to be led somewhere where people can ask me questions. So we'll do that instead. Thanks very much, everyone.